Um, thank you very much for being here. We have a small, but it looks like a fairly enthusiastic group. Since uh, Joe kind of opened it with uh, saying that uh, I go up to Saratoga because I actually am involved in racehorses, I have to start with this. Does anybody know who won the Kentucky Derby this year? Somebody in here must know who won the Kentucky Derby this year. Well, I will, <coughs> if you don't remember anything else from this course, you'll remember that Orb won the Kentucky Derby. And my daughter's an assistant trainer and exercise rider for Orb. So I have to admit I'm being a proud father. <laughs> anyway, again, welcome to Charitable Giving Through the Donation of Real Estate. I got my uh, CCIM designation in 1981, and I've been in the real estate business for 40 years. And, you know, in the 1981, I learned about exchanges, installment sales. I didn't learn anything about charitable giving, although charitable giving of real estate has been around a lot longer than I. It is probably the most underutilized, least understood method of moving real estate in our, in our business. The CCIM Foundation recognized that and consequently put together a course to educate everyone on the concepts and benefits of charitable giving. The CCIM Foundation, for those of you who are not familiar with it, its mission statement is to educate commercial realtors, advance and foster commercial real estate uh, via scholarships, we give scholarships for the core courses, programs and initiatives. So consequently, we de developed this course. I should add that we developed it in conjunction with a gentleman named Chase Magnuson, who's a CCIM, who is director of real estate giving for George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And a little side note, George Washington University is the second largest owner of real estate in Washington, D.C. behind the federal government. So you can see Chase has been pretty, pretty active. I've given this course uh, throughout the country, and I will tell you, this is real world stuff. Transactions have been made utilizing the concepts that people learn in this course. So this is a real, this is really a real world uh, situation. When I do these courses, I do have three rules. Rule number one, there's no such thing as a dumb question. So please, if you have a question, please ask it. Second rule is I don't stand up here and pretend to have all the knowledge. In fact, I gave this course in New upstate New York, and I had two people in the course who had done real estate gifting transactions, which they shared with the class, which was really beneficial. So if you have anything to add, please don't hesitate. However, rule number three, if you disagree with me, keep quiet. <laughs> so on that note, let's start. What we will cover, an overview of the charitable world, who is the typical donor, why do they donate real estate to charities? Type, ooh, sorry about that. Types of real estate that can be donated, issues specific to real estate, options for real estate donations, the impact on the charity. Now the purpose of this course is not to make anybody an expert in charitable giving but to make you aware of the concepts and the alternatives in disposing of property. How many of you out there have a property listed that is way underneath the appraised value? Appraisal is way up here, you price it down here, and you can't sell it. I bet every one of us has a couple of those properties. And this is an alternative to disposing of those properties. And you'll see how 
as we go through this course, how that can benefit your client. Okay, there are about a million three hundred thousand charities in the U.S. In other words, there are a million three hundred entities that have been given the designation by the IRS of 501c3. That's the key. That when you donate to an entity that has a 501c3 designation, you have the, the tax benefits. Interesting side note, do you realize that 7% of our employment is employed by charities throughout the United States? In 2010, 300 billion was given in, to the charities, and that has been fairly constant, even in the downturn. However, real estate is accepted with only 2% of that 300 billion, or six billion dollars. Why do you think that's true? Why is real estate such a minor part of giving? Well, it kind of goes back to the, or it doesn't kind of, it goes back to charities themselves. Most charities don't have the staff necessary to handle real estate gifts. They don't have the knowledge, expertise. They don't have the resources. Having been on a lot of charitable boards, the boards themselves are conservative. So you don't make a mistake uh, taking a flyer on something. It's up to us to attempt to mitigate those aspects of what the charities have as far as refusing to take or hesitant to take real estate gifts. I think it's 80%, as I said, 80% of them turn it down. So there's a large untapped market because as you can see, real estate represents $27 trillion of the capital worth. Now, if some of you were in the, uh, the gentleman's class from University of Denver yesterday, the uh, PhD, this is kind of a moving target. The stocks go up, go down, real estate goes up and goes down, and certainly that real estate portion, a uh, good percentage of that is uh, residential. But if you look at that chart, that's two one-hundredths of a percent of real estate is given to charities of the total wealth. There's a huge untapped market. There's great opportunities out there that we need to take advantage of. Agent client benefits. Marketing opportunities. Already alluded to this. You know, we're all familiar with outright sales. Uh, exchanges, installment sales. But this is another way to market the property. Particularly those properties that are sticking to your fingers, that are so frustrating because you know there's great value there, but you can't move them. Represent new clients. Obviously the charities themselves would be the new client. Public relations exposure. I mean, you're involved in something that gives given to a charitable organization. That's a real benefit because you will get very good positive publicity from that. Guarantee you. Referral opportunities. Once you do one of these, people are going to be coming to you, looking for it, for you to help them. Oh, I want to go back. Well, it's not on here, but it says agent client benefits question that I bet is going through some of, you, of your minds is, what about us? How do we get paid on this? Commissions can be made because what's gonna, what happens with most properties is they're given the charity. Charity doesn't want to hold them. They want to convert that real asset to cash. So you would be selling the property on behalf of the charity. And this can already be worked up front. You know, you could have the donor could be part, paying part of your fee. You can work out fees. But there's money to be made, guarantee it. 
Let's look at the profile of the donors. First of all, individuals, typically 65 or older, or doesn't have to be 65, whatever. They're typically older. There was a, um, I read a statistic where those people above 65, 83% of them do not have debt on real estate. That probably really includes a lot of residential real estate. I hate to admit it, but I'm not included in that 83%. Corporations. Corporations are prime candidates, and that's really where kind of most of our focus would be. But individuals would certainly have investment properties. It is estimated that corporate real estate corporations in the United States have $175 billion worth of excess real estate. Philanthropic intent. Regardless of the tax benefits, and we're going to talk about those, the philanthropic intent is still has to be the overriding in fact, factor in, in giving of, of uh, real estate. And those individuals or corporations which have assets, which have greatly appreciated, have low yields, or have become difficult to manage and need for supplemental retirement income. I'm going to put those two together and give you a classic example of a potential client. Someone who's older, and actually, when I was uh, in New York, one of the persons in the class came up to me later and said, I have this individual who's 80 years old. He has a whole portfolio of investment properties, which he's had for years. So what, he, what this person has is something that, that has huge capital gain exposure. No longer wants the management headaches, but still needs the income stream. Now, if he were to sell outright, he would have the capital gains. Exchange is not a possibility because the individual wanted to get out of real estate, divest himself of the real estate. Could do an installment sale to generate income, but you know that's not guaranteed. Whether the person um, doesn't make the payments, you know, you still have that. The ideal thing, and we're going to talk about the very specifics later on, would be a charitable gift annuity or a charitable remainder trust. And we'll talk about those, how they can accomplish all that, minimize the tax exposure, get rid of the management responsibilities, but still generate an income. And of course, the public image. Everyone wants to have a great public image, whether it's a corporation or an individual. And giving real estate to a charity generates that positive public image. What's in it for the donor? Reduce capital gains. In some cases, elimination of capital gains. Deductions for federal and state taxes. State taxes, I've got to give you a caveat. Depending on where you're from, there's what is known as compliant and non-compliant states. Non-compliant states minimize the, the, the state tax benefits. So you need to be very careful about that in your state. And we're going to talk about a team. We're just part of, as a real estate professional, part of a team. You'll, you'll see that. Lower transfer taxes, elimination of the management responsibility, Benefits to the individual owner, donor rather. Increased income stream, I've alluded to that, we'll go into more detail. Providing social capital for various charities, that's part of the feel good of doing this. Focus on estate planning, only 40% of Americans have wills. I mean, most people don't want, want to think about dying, so they kind of shove that aside. But this helps people focus. 
What are the tax implications? For the individual donor, the write-offs are limited each year to 30% of AGI, adjusted gross income. For corporate donors, it's limited to 10%. So you don't necessarily get a great windfall, tax windfall initially, but there, there are tax benefits that you can take advantage over, take advantage of. Subchapter S are not eligible for write-offs. So if, you have, if you're dealing with a subchapter S, it has to be converted to a corporation or an LLC. Carry forward rules, going back to the individual donor. I said it's limited to 30% of AGI each year. You have a five year carry forward. So basically an individual has six years to take advantage of the tax benefits. Appraisal rules, and we're coming down to the most important thing about charitable giving. Your write off are based on the appraisal. It's not based on the basis of the property. It's not based on what the charity eventually sells the property. It's based on the appraisal. And this is really where the beauty of this comes in. It goes back to what I was saying, where you had a property that the true value is up here, easily justified, but you can't sell it. You can only sell it at a steep discount. And that's where the benefits come in to a client who can take advantage of the tax benefits and has other needs. Appraisal rules, the appraisal has to be within 60 days of the transfer of the property to the charity. This can pose some problems because we'll talk about the fact that uh, charity does not necessarily uh, take possession of the property within 60 days. So in some cases, you're going to have to have multiple appraisals. But the key is the 60-day rule. I'll go through this fairly quickly because basically what it boils down to, almost all types of real estate are eligible for charitable gifting. I'll just focus on a couple. Single family homes, just for your own edification, uh, retained life estates or bequests are typically used with single family homes. Residential lots, I was, I had a, I was meeting with uh, the development office of the University of Virginia, which where I went, and they were given a bunch of lots in Florida. And I found out that that is not unusual, that you, apparently there are a bunch of people have these lots in Florida and they've given them as a, a, to the, their favorite charity. One thing you see subdivision there, the only deviation from the appraisal rule is a developer that owns lots. If a developer gives lots to a charity, it's the basis is the write-off. It doesn't have anything to do with the appraisal in that case. Uh, condo, I just want to drop down. That's, that's another aspect that has been utilized. Condo, and I'm really talking about second home, where you've had uh, a family that's owned a uh, second home for an extended period of time, so their, their basis is low. Kids aren't using it. We've known what happened in the second home market. Condos or second homes are primary candidates for charitable gifting. Industrial property, as I mentioned, corporations have $175 billion of excess property. There's lots of opportunity there. I just want to go down to commercial papers. You can see it's everything. Well, international assets, unlike uh, 1031 exchanges, you can use international assets in charitable giving and take advantage of the tax benefits in the United States. Commercial paper. I had a situation at a community foundation come to me and say, uh, uh, this 
these people want to give us the second mortgage on this property that they have. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, second mortgage was behind the first mortgage on the bank on development ground, and it was underwater with the first mortgage. So this did not become something that happened, obviously. But as you can see, almost anything that you can envision with real estate is a candidate for charitable giving. Who is on the team? Attorney, CPA, and it says, or financial advisor. I'd really like to say and. Uh, we'll go into this more detail, but when you come to charitable remainder trusts and, and um, charitable annuities, you really need to have the attorney, CPA, and financial advisor involved. We're only part of this team. As you see, real estate professionals such as a CCI and designate. And I really look at us as the quarterback of this team because there's lots of different components of charitable giving that need to be coordinated. It's kind of somewhat like herding cats, but somebody, the, we will be the ones doing it. You know, we're not attorneys, we're not CPAs, we're not financial planners, although I know that some CCIMs are CPAs and some are attorneys. But it's a, we're just part of the team. Our expertise really is the real estate itself and the coordination of the charitable giving. The appraiser, as I talked about, this is a really important part of the gifting process because the, the write-offs are all based on the appraisal. The IRS maintains that the appraiser must have knowledge of local product, must be qualified, and also must be qualified to handle that particular type of real estate. And there have been court cases where the appraisal has been thrown out because of the fact that they determined that the appraiser was, in fact, not qualified. Title company, make sure that you have clear title, that there are no liens. Charities don't want to take over properties that have liens on them. And a professional facilitator, such as a CCIM Education Foundation or other foundation with expertise in this area. Going back to what I said in the very beginning, most charities don't have the staff, the expertise, anybody to handle this. What their the main function of the CCIM Foundation would be is to act as a facilitator. We have the policies and procedures in place to handle it. We have the expertise. We have the resources. Everybody's gotten this brochure, right? This is the blue brochure. I'd like for you to read what it says right on the front of the brochure. Making the giving of real estate possible so charitable organizations can fulfill their mission. In other words, give them the ability to take on real estate and convert that to cash. That's what they ultimately want to do. And that's a role that we can really play in this, to show a charity, hey, you know, you don't have to handle this. We can handle everything for you. And what typically happens is you negotiate a percentage of what the property ultimately sells for as compensation. I mean, we're not the only facilitators, but there are not very many in this country. Because as, as we said, stated, or I stated right in the very beginning, this is not widespread, but there's untapped opportunities here. And I think this brochure explains it very well. And I thank Doug Strickland for putting it together. OK, real property issues. And this is where we come in. It doesn't have to be an MAI report. 
but it does have to be an appraiser who's qualified, as I said, I'm repeating myself, but the appraisal is such an integral and important part of the charitable giving process. It has to be somebody who is qualified, has knowledge of that locale, and knowledge of the product. Environmental impact study, this also is really important, and this is why a lot of large charities shy away from taking real estate. There's a famous case, the Boy Scouts of America were given an industrial piece of land outside of Chicago that was environmentally impacted. This cost the Boy Scouts of America five million dollars. And again, any development officer in a large charity is fully aware of that, and you mentioned real estate to them. Yeah. So that's something that is difficult for us to overcome, but needs to be overcome. But you tell them we will have the environmental impact study done first thing to ensure that there is no liability. Title insurance, talked about the, the fact that you can ensure that uh, it doesn't have liens against it. I mean, it's typical of almost any real estate transaction. Power to sell, does the donor in fact have the power to sell? And the last thing you want to do is, or in this case, donate. Litigation over who's, who's going to benefit as far as the donor's concerned. Radon, and, and the last one's ADA. Charity is reluctant to have take over a property that has an ADA, American Disabilities Act, problem. These all need to be done. Their responsibility of the expertise in those areas, but it's the real estate professional, it's you or I, that coordinates and makes sure all these, these aspects of the charitable giving process are taken care of. Again, I said uh, when we talked about the team, we're the quarterback of the team. And certainly that's part of the team too, the engineer who does environmental study. We make sure that those things get done. Okay, let's get down to the real nitty gritty of this. The basic options for real estate donations, straight or outright donation, Bargain sale, bequest, charitable gift annuity, charitable remainder trust, retained life estate. Let's talk about the outright donation. Pretty simple. Real property is transferred to a charity outright or in a trust. No binding agreement for resale as of the date of the gift, which would activate capital gains to the donor. You cannot have this property under agreement prior to donating to the charity. I actually got in a conversation at dinner two nights ago where somebody says, well, I have this property, it's under agreement, I'm going to donate it. I said, no, you can't do that. It cannot be under agreement prior to the donation. It's a clean transaction for the donor. You see that this is basically schematically how it works. Donor gives the property to the charity. The deed, the reason the deed shows going to the buyer is ideally they want a simultaneous closing. In other words, the deed goes to the charity, and the charity gives it to the new buyer so they don't have to take over the property. However, many donors will insist on the charity holding the property for three years. Because if the property is not held by the charity for three years, Form 8282 has to be filed stating that the charity took the property and immediately sold it. The problem had that arises is that 99% of the cases, the sale of the property to the new buyer is significantly less 
than the appraisal. And that raises red flags. I will tell you that based on the information that we've received and court cases that have been reviewed, is the IRS has not disqualified any of these transactions when the appraisal exceeded the ultimate sale by a significant amount. So the ideal thing for the charity is to sell it right away, not even hold it for a period of time. Again, certain donors are going to insist on them holding it for three years because after three years they don't have to file anything with the IRS. There's no red flags. The problem for the donor, the downside for the donor, is that on the appraisal has to reflect the fact that the charity is holding it for three years and therefore the appraisal would be discounted accordingly. So they're giving up uh, some write-offs in exchange for some certainty that they're not going to be audited by the IRS. Anybody have any questions, comments on this? Could you say that again? Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. But the question was that asked me just to repeat the three years. If you hold it for three years, there will not be any IRS scrutiny. If you, if you dictate to the charity that the property that you're giving to, that they hold it for three years, there's no IRS audit, no IRS scrutiny. If it's a simultaneous or sold by the charity within a three-year period, it's IRS Form 8282, it has to be filed advising the charity, advise, excuse me, advising the IRS that the charity sold the property for X, which as said 99.9% .9 of the cases, is going to be significantly less than the appraisal. Again, repeating myself, it's our understanding what we've been advised, what we've seen, that that has not been a problem with people's <laughs> deductions being negated. I think one of the reasons is because of the market, particularly the market in the last five years, where, where properties have gone down so significantly where you don't have a, a strong demand and you know you can justify the value of a property just on the replacements of the bricks and mortar. So it's not necessarily a problem, but a donor's attorney is probably going to raise that red flag. Oh, I don't want this uh, sold within uh, three years. So then that particular charity has to have the resources to continue holding the property. So that's a problem. And then actually, at the very end of the program, so. The, why they don't want to hold a property. The first time I gave this course, I had a, a gentleman in my office, I gave it in Delaware, first time we gave this course. A uh, guy in my office had an industrial piece of ground. It was on the water. He could, they could not sell the property. It was just, it was, in a part of town which uh, nobody wanted to, to be in. There was no market for this property. So after taking this course, he went back to the seller and said, look, we can give this property away. You can get a big tax deduction, uh, some nice publicity, and because we can justify a value way up here, this this could be the way to go. So they actually gave it to a charity. It's called the Kalmar Nickel. Kalmar Nickel, not that anybody gives a rat's ass. Kalmar Nickel was a boat that the Swedes came over and settled Wilmington, Delaware, where I'm from. They needed an industrial piece because they were working on their boat, and they needed the water. It was perfect. So they, they just gave this piece to the Kalmar Nickel Foundation. So it wasn't even a case of the property getting resold. But it would have never happened if, I, if he hadn't heard that this was an alternative 
for the disposition of real estate. So that's a real world situation. Okay, bequests, I'll go over this pretty quickly. Wills must be written and witnessed. We talked about 40% of people don't have wills. Include charitable beneficiaries as desired. Charity receives bequests upon death of the donor. Review and update is necessary based on changes. And seek advice of wills and the state attorney. The last thing goes back to the team, regardless of whatever one of these uh, types of uh, charitable giving concepts are utilized. The attorney is a valuable member of the team. Charitable gift annuity. Now I'm going to go over this fairly quickly. This is pretty complicated. This is where, because there's so many IRS regulations, this is where you need the attorney, the CPA, and the financial planner. Donor transfers real estate in exchange for a guaranteed life income under a contract. And guaranteed life is the key words in that. Charity receives the property, sells it, contributes the proceeds to a reserve to make payments to the donor. Some annuity income may be tax-free, but any capital gains taxes on the asset transferred are paid over the annuitant's life expectancy. What happens with this is that, oh, before I go into that, again, this is not available in all states due to regulations. Some states have capital requirements for the charity in order to give a charitable gift annuity. Gift annuity rates are based on age. In other words, the annuity rate is set by the IRS based on the age. Review of IRS tables for discount rates. That has to do with the, the tax benefits uh, and other aspects associated with it. In other words, it's something that you and I would not get involved in. We would only advise a client that this is an alternative. He needs or she needs to go to her CPA or a financial planner to determine whether this is a viable option. Now, the donor, similar to the outright gift, donor gives it to the charity. Ideally, it's a simultaneous sale. The cash goes into the bank and then is distributed to the donor on a yearly basis or monthly basis, or whatever you decide, based on the interest rate that is determined by the IRS. The benefit to the donor in this, this is life. That individual is guaranteed that income for life. The downside for the charity with charitable gift annuities is if a person lives to 105, they're screwed because they're going to have to continue making the payments. So a charitable gift annuity uh, a don't, probably is more uh, attractive to the donor, but less attract, can be less attractive to the charity because of the risk. The other alternative, which is similar, is a charitable remainder unit trust. It's an irrevocable trust with two sets of beneficiaries, income and charitable. Income beneficiary is usually a donor who receives a percentage of income from the trust for life or term of years. Charitable beneficiary receives the principal of the trust after the income beneficiary dies. No payment of capital gains taxes because of assets ultimately received by the charity. The difference between the charitable remainder trust and charitable gift annuity is there tax, there's some tax implica implications to the donor. There, the donor does not have tax implications. In other words, no capital gains. 
IRS rules prior to percentage payouts and net fair market value of the assets. Again, that's why you need people with expertise in this arena to structure it. That's not where we come in. The donor gives it to the uh, charity. Charity is sold. New buyer, net proceeds go into a trust. The advantage to the charity with charitable remainder trust is the percentage that's paid out is based on what the balance is in the trust. So the worst that can happen is they end up with no money because they exhausted the trust. But there's no liability to the charity because once it's exhausted, it's exhausted. The benefit to the donor is twofold. One, better tax benefits. This is compared to the charitable uh, annuity. And the interest rate is not set by the IRS. So you can have a higher interest rate. So that's the big differences. There are other differences, and it is not, I don't pretend to know everything that should be known about both charitable annuities and charitable remainder trusts. But understand the concept. And it goes back to what I said right in the very beginning. The gentleman that was in his early 80s had investment assets with low basis, wanted to avoid the taxes, still want, want, needed an income stream, either charitable remainder trust or charitable annuity was the ideal alternative in that case. And I'm sure you all have run into situations where people wanted to invest property, they had a big tax exposure, so you say, well, in exchange. Well, maybe they didn't. They didn't want real estate anymore. They wanted to get out of it. So these are really viable alternatives to real-world situations. Bargain sale. Sale of an asset to charity at less than fair market value. Donor benefits by bypass on gain on gift portion and receives a charitable deduction on gift portion. Donor must recognize taxable gain on value uh, value return to donor. Now the very first one we saw an outright. Very rarely will a charity accept a, a gift with a mortgage on it. So in many cases you have a property that has a, a lien against it, a mortgage against it. So if you wanted to give an outright sale, somehow you're going to have to satisfy that, that lien prior to giving it. Bargain sales enable you to sell the property, satisfy the, the lien, and still give the property away. You will have a tax on the portion that is not given away. And in this situation, a donor uh, transfer property to a charity, donates to a charity, you have a buyer, sale price is 100000 In this case, there was $40,000 debt. Again, this is just an example. So you have $60,000 in gift. $100,000, uh, less than $40,000, the $60,000 in equity. There's capital gains is paid on the sale portion of the transaction. The same seminar I just told you about when I had the outright gift the guy in my office. There's another gentleman in that class, ironically enough, was an industrial piece of ground, couldn't sell it. They did have a lien on it, and they did a bargain sale to get rid of the property. Again, this is real world stuff, boys and girls, and you can really take, it, take advantage of it. Any questions on this? Actually, yeah. Uh, Chase Magnuson, I just talked to Chase Magnuson. He was the gentleman I said that helped us structure this course. He was a CCIM from Washington, D.C. does the uh, uh, real estate gifting for George Washington. He said, I want to tell you about a, a transaction I just did on a bargain sale. He said these people had this condominium in D.C. worth $2 million. And I 
again, this is a residential property, but the concept's still the same. They did a bargain sale. They bought it. Actually, they took title to it because GW has the resources to do this. They bought it for a million dollars. So the donor got a million dollar write-off. GW had to pay a million dollars, took title of the property. They turned around and resold it within three months for a million two fifty. So after all their costs, they put $200,000 in their development fund, which is a pretty nice return in a very short period of time. Wouldn't you agree? Now, quite frankly, if you're dealing with the local humane society, they would not be able to come up with a million dollars. So it depends on the type of charity that you're dealing with. Structure retained life estate. This is, I'll go through this fairly quickly, but you know, it might apply to people you know or your own situation. Primary or secondary homes qualify. Donor must maintain the property, pay the property taxes, insurance. In other words, you don't own the property anymore, but you can live it in, but it's gonna cost you as if you still owned it. Option to lease for another source of income or sell remaining interest to charity or lump sum. In other words, if you move out of your house and you have retained life estate, you still have the ability to rent it and generate some income. Charitable gift annuity may be possible di uh, additional benefit. In other words, you can, the point is you convert it to something else. A charitable gift annuity or a charitable remainder trust. The advantage of retained life estates is that you get immediate tax deduction as opposed to bequest. Remember to bequest, basically you're telling them, telling the charity you get the property after I die. There are really no tax benefits. The only benefits with a bequest is you're saving maybe fights among your kids or something. But with a retained life estate, there is a deduction. Now, uh, based on life expectancy, the appraisal is discounted accordingly. You know, if you're 90 and the properties were 100, you get very close to 100 right away. If you're 60, you know, it's going to be discounted down. So it minimizes your tax benefit. How to convert to equity? Cash. Cash is always fun. That's what the charities want. That's not necessarily possible, not in all cases. Cash and carried financing. Charity can certainly sell a property and take by the financing themselves and provide income, which may be very beneficial. 1031 exchanges, partial you can exchange, the charity could exchange the property to something that may be more saleable or marketable. Joint ventures, this probably has to do more with uh, unimproved land, joint venture with a developer to generate income. So there's lots of flexibility. What happens to the closing of the sale of the donated property? Title company divides the funds. You might be in a state like I am where uh, attorneys are the ones that handle the closing. But all normal closing costs are paid. Donor or charity fund the gift arrangement. Reimbursement of funds used to obtain reports and consulting services. I should have brought this up. Uh, a few slides ago, and I apologize for not. In most cases, and it's important that you advise the donor of this, in most cases, the donor pays for all the, the, the uh, investigations, reports, studies up front. In other words, environmental impact study, the appraisal, obviously the appraisal is for the donor anyway, so that, that, that the donor would pay for that. But any of the studies, any of the environmental studies, any of the title studies are normally paid by the donor. They may or may not be uh, reimbursed. And what I should all, one thing I did skip over, which I should have done back when I talked about the outright gift, is the process. It's a question you probably all were thinking about. What is the process of donating uh, real estate to a charity. Well, it's fairly simple, and it's not unlike what we, we deal day in and day out with our commercial real estate business. It starts out with an LOI, letter of intent. 
submitted to the charity. The charity and their advisors would look at the property, do a preliminary investigation of the property at their, their cost, and then make a decision of whether they want to accept the property. Then you move into an agreement of sale, not unlike what we do all, every day, stating the specifics of the donation, what kind of donation it is. Uh, and there is normally a due diligence period. And 180 days is not unusual. It gives the charity an opportunity to make all the studies of the property and ensure they don't get stuck with a property like the Boy Scouts of America. Also gives them the opportunity to market the property so they come up a simultaneous closing. The problem with the 180 day due diligence period is for the donor. Because the donor's probably done an appraisal, gonna have to do another appraisal. Remember I said the appraisal has to be within the 60 day window. So that can be problematic. And then you go to the closing, which is where we are in the slides right now. And uh, reimbursement of funds used to obtain reports. That is not necessarily always true. Again, that's a negotiated item whether the donor can get reimbursed or not. How might the charity benefit? Obviously, cash proceeds from the sale of the asset. That's what they want is cash. And this is another way for them to generate cash. Income stream from leases. This is assuming that they take title of the property and keep it. But that can happen too. Joint venture profits, talked about the fact with uh, unimproved land, the charity could joint venture with a developer, builder, to generate, turn the asset into cash. Exchange opportunities, ownership of office facilities. We actually do have, I have a charity in this Wilmington that was given a building, and that's where their offices are, are now. There are some tax implications for a charity if they hold up property for an extended period of time, and that needs to be checked out with the charity's uh, attorney. Issues for charity in evaluating real estate. The environmental impact study, you've seen this up here two or three times, but it's so important, and as I said, it's on the minds of anybody who's a development officer in a charity, because they're aware of the famous Boy Scouts case. The ADA, again, as I said, charities are reluctant to uh, take on properties. It just doesn't look good with an ADA problem. Wetlands, part of the environmental study. Review of leases, again, this is where we come in as a real estate professional to oversee that these things are done on behalf of the charity and the charity is protected. So yeah, I guess, in a lot of cases, you'd be in a classic dual agency situation. Again, with the issues for charity, loan liability, they're reluctant to take on liens, but if the only way they can take, get the property is to accept that loan liability. Again, if the donor insists on the, the charity holding it for three years. The staff oversight and time. The fact that most charities do not have that. And I'm getting the sign that I need to start finishing up, but we are at the end of it anyway, so I'll go through these pretty quickly. Property management, again, this is where our expertise comes in. If they need somebody to manage the property, I mean, that is the way we can get paid. Annual holding costs, property taxes, again, this is why they don't want it. Insurance, uh, staffing, maintenance, loss of income, you know, the uh, things, as we all know, being in this business, you know, the property can change as far as, you know, as far as environmental impact issues are concerned during a holding period. Injury to visitors, liability, down zoning. You know, they could, the property could have lesser value during their holding period. Utility moratorium, I'm sure we've all run into that with properties. And downturn in property values. So that's why they don't want to hold it. So conclusion review, 
benefit to the, the donor, tax implications, tax benefits rather, and the ability to sell a property that you could not otherwise sell. Various types of real estate donations we talked about benefit the charity, the team, and that's really important. We're part of the team, but as I said, I consider us the quarterback of that team. Thank you very much, unless you have any questions. Any questions for Duncan? Any questions whatsoever? Anybody have any questions? I, I have one. Uh, I know we got some events coming up, but one quick question, and that is um, uh, the, the charity, in order to set this up, uh, what kind of reports and documentations would be, would be best for the donor to have ready to give to the charity ahead of time? I know you mentioned, they're, will they do their own like, environmental impact studies and things like that, or is it best to have that up front done or let them do it themselves? Well, the, uh, I think it's more a question of advising the charity if you get a property. I actually had a property that was turned down but for not reasons, but I, I said, you know, we're going to have environmental studies, we're going to get ADA studies, we're going to do all this to ensure that this is a property that you actually want, because in this case, they were going to have to take title to it, that you want. So I think, yeah, it'd be helpful to have a list, but you can also verbalize it too. It depends, okay. you know, it's like selling real estate. Some of us are more comfortable when we have material in front of us, and others of us are just... We just shoot from the hip sometimes, right? Any, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. I take back that remark. Any other questions or comments whatsoever? Yes, sir. I've got a quick, quick question. In the, in the event of a donation, oh. in the event of a, uh, a donation, did you say that uh, the IRS would recognize a price reduction in lieu of, like, so if you were making a uh, let's, let's call it a half million dollar land contribution, and the market, fair market value of that land was actually a million. Um, will the IRS if, recognize a discounted price? What, what I'm saying is that the appraisal is the basis for your charitable deductions. Most charities, and we just talked about this at the very end, will not want to hold a property. They want to divest themselves of that property. So you got a value up here to a million dollars. In most cases, it's going to sell for a fairly significant discount. Most cases, the IRS has not has allowed the deduction. It has nothing to do with what, uh, what the sale is. If the donor is concerned that the IRS may disallow the deduction, that goes back to holding the property, the charity having to hold the property for three years, which they don't or are reluctant to do for what we just saw at the very end. If the charity sells the property within the three years, Form 8282 has to be filed. So it puts the IRS on notice that the property did sell for X, and if they look at your tax return, they'll see that you deducted X plus plus because it was based on the appraisal. Does that clarify it for you? I, I guess so. And I'm, one more quick question in regard to uh, maybe just some advice. This particular transaction I'm working on, uh, family has a large parcel around a school. And the school's expressed interest in that land. They, they reached out and asked for a possible donation. We talked about discounting the land. Then we thought, well, maybe we should sell them half the land, take the other half, and contribute that so there would be a tax benefit on the contribution, and yet they'd still recognize some cash on the sale. Yes, that's, that's the classic example of a bargain sale. And I did a bargain sale probably 15, 20 years ago on a big track of land, which was owned by the DuPont family, and they wanted to give it to this conservancy, but they also needed some cash. So it was a classic bargain sale. You know, it was a couple million dollar property. A million dollars was donated to the conservancy, and a million dollars they received in cash. That's a classic bargain sale, and this is an example of what you could do with a property that's adjacent to the school. 
assuming that the school is a 501c3. You have to be careful of that. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, but during the three years that donor requested, okay, the charity, they can collect the revenue from it. So it's not too bad, really, for them. So during a three year period, Yes, I mean, yes, the charity is holding the property. In the case, I gave you an example of the University of Virginia has, was given some lots in Florida. The, the donor required them to hold the property for three years. There, there, there's no income coming from that property, but they do have the taxes that they have to pay on it. Uh, they have to maintain the property, cut the grass. They have to maintain insurance because of the potential liability. All the reasons are at the very end. We were saying why charities don't want to hold property. Now, the University of Virginia has the ability to hold property, but your local humane society probably doesn't. So it depends on the charities. Uh, anyone else? Has anyone done this before? Anyone been involved with one? Uh, I, I've done one real quick, real quick, and let me just share with you, I'm a broker, and uh, I came, I brought, I pulled my CCM stuff out, and I explained to these, uh, a dentist told, said to me, if I sell this thing, I'm gonna pay a lot in capital gains tax because my base is very low. And that was the motivation to donate it to a charity because uh, they reaped a lot of benefits, and he was willing to accept whatever the value was. We actually got a buyer right up front, and whatever that buyer paid from it, from the charity, they accepted that as a donation. So that way, you know, whatever, at the, the day of closing, boom, gave it right there. Anyway, uh, Duncan, appreciate it. And uh, it just so happens, uh, what's the CCM Foundation? Yeah. C CCIM Foundation? Yeah, do you know what that, what, 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 what do they do? Well, the mission statement of the CCIM Foundation is to advance and foster commercial real estate education through scholarships, we give, uh, Joe's on the board, Ralph's on the board, Shirley's on the board, so you got some board members here. Scholarships for the core courses. We do programs. This is an example of a program and the initiatives, you know, that's trying to foster interest in the charitable giving. I mean, initially, what, when we did this, we thought, well, we'll get properties given to the, the foundation. Well, that's not realistic in the sense, you know, there's heart cancer, diabetes, there's hundreds of others that come before us as far as what people want to donate to. So our real, the real benefit to both the, the CCIM Foundation and to people doing this is that we're set up to be facilitators. facilitators. We can make this happen on your behalf. And any one of us can, can uh, assist you with it. Ralph is actually, Ralph and I are co-chair of the charitable giving, and I will tell you that Ralph has, has done much more work than uh, I have on this. I'm kind of the talking head. He's the expert. <laughs> Go ahead. I just want to make, uh, if anybody here are representing or have uh, involvement with their chapter, one of the things, I don't know if you mentioned, uh, Duncan had, we developed a course, and one of the things, actually three levels of course, a 20 minute, an hour presentation, as well as a three-hour continuing education that's been approved, I think, in five states now for continuing education. And we're looking to expand the number of states that approve that for continuing education. And we're developing the place for 2014 to work with chapters to actually put the course on, give you continuing education opportunity, and, and uh, for the chapter to expand the knowledge and familiarity with this content. Yeah, and the three-hour course obviously goes into much more detail particularly with the charitable gift annuities and the charitable remainder trust, plus we do case studies. So it's much more in depth and we've, uh, we've actually given it quite a bit. I, and of course, it's been uh, very well received. Well, Duncan, thank you so much. Uh, give Duncan a round of applause. Thank you very much for attending.